I'd first like to start off saying this has been a wonderful conference. Lots of great ideas, lots of great information that I have experienced um, through what everybody's brought in this room and a lot of people here has presented. And I'm really excited about the opportunities that architecture is going into. Um, a little about myself, um, as she said earlier, I was an entertainment technology designer. I've designed churches and nightclubs for 15 years. And that kind of obsession with the common language has kind of per pervaded into my architectural studies. I'd like to start off with um, this quote. There's no architecture without action, no ar architecture without events, no architecture without program. By extension, there's no architecture without violence. And I'd like to take Shumi's quote and take it a little bit further. I'd say that architecture doesn't end at completion, but begins at occupation. I get a little obsessed with my own words, and so I want to start with this thesis, which I can think sums up everything I want to talk about today. Design, is, design has ignored the natural processes of social segregation, letting other factors dominate the occupational organization of the built environment, ultimately isolating communities and their members. By incorporating modern social behavior analysis into a design logic, social spaces can facilitate more productive engagements between occupants through an informed understanding of how space and program influences behavior and in service of creating a more diverse and sustainable community. To begin with a social understanding of how society works, I'd like to introduce uh, two, actually, two philosophical concepts and one mathematical one. The Schelling's model of segregation ultimately says that it's not prejudice that segregates community, it's preference. And to understand Schelling's model of segregation, I want to take you through kind of the process. It's a very simple game you can play at home with quarters and dimes or checker pieces. And what you do is you take a random grid, two identifiers. They could be anything color, you could pick, you know, the, the denominations of your, of your money. And you create spaces and occupied spaces. And what you do is you establish an ultimate criterion and say, hey, my blue space is not happy unless a third of all of its neighbors are blue. And so when you do this, what you do is you, you establish the criteria. And then you identify the unhappy agents. And so this, we have the red, the red um, circle surrounded by the black dot. He's unhappy because 12.5% of his occupants are, are, are the same color, and he would like to have a third. So then he moves to an open space. And when he moves to an open space, you reestablish the criteria, and we can see in this space, a third of its, or it's actually 37.5% of its neighbors are of the same color, so it's happy. And so this mathematical model shows kind of the inherent problematic conditions of culture that even if we eliminate all prejudice, if we eliminate all dislikes, we will still segregate ourselves according to preferences. And the other thing that happens is we can see if we start with a random grid and we have the unmet criteria and they keep moving around, what happens is you get constant migration with spaces and you see this in cities where you have cultural conditions where certain areas never quite settle. And part of the settling has to do with basically border conditions that create a place of uncertainty. So even if you begin with diversity, even a 33% preference, even less, will ultimately end up in segregation of our cities, segregation of our, our living spaces. So the issue of segregations is difficult to resolve because segregation is a result of preference, not a lack of education or prejudice. The second philosophical concept is called the mere exposure effect. And this actual experiment works less in an architectural room than it does in common culture simply because architects inherently are rebellious. So if you can imagine, I would like everyone just to imagine this is stocks. And you have $10,000 to invest. You have to pick three stocks to invest in. Which three stocks do you pick? And you guys can do this little experiment with me, but I have, I have found it's a, it's a little less successful in this type of environment. But what happens is, within common culture, within basically the experiments I've run, the majority of the people pick tan, barn, and clem. Not necessarily, and within English speakers, it's a little different than if your native language is something else, simply because the other three are less familiar. So if you're going to pick something, you pick the one that's most familiar when there's uncertainty on the line. It was first proposed by a, a psychologist in the 19th century, but it wasn't until 1968 that... Zions um, presented, came up with an experiment and he presented one to 25 Chinese characters to obviously to people who don't speak Chinese, otherwise this would be pointless. And he would show them different characters over a given amount of time and then 
show them a new character and say, is this character inherently good or inherently bad? Does this character mean something that's positive or something that's negative? And he found a correlation with the number of times that he showed randomly before the experiment that they would rank goodness to symbols they saw more than other times. This idea of mere exposure was, has been studied upon and has now become kind of the backbone of the way we market. And Seaman, Brody, and Koff in 1983 explained that mere exposure using a two-factor theory states that repeated exposure to a stimulus fosters the ease in which a stimulus can be processed. Perpetual fluency promotes positive effect. So basically, as you repeat, you're able to process the information faster and creates a positive effect through the ease of the process, the procession. And then Robert Bornstein in 1989 found that the effect is strongest when unfamiliar stimuli are presented briefly. Subtle indirect messages are most effective. Within his own studies and what we've learned in marketing, if someone knows they're being advertised to, they resist. So if you say, you should be doing this, well, your, your immediate response is, I should not. You don't even listen to what they were saying, so you kind of have a negative effect. But if you don't know you're being advertised to, which is why subliminal advertising has become illegal, you are more apt to agree and latch on to a concept. So the mere exposure effect is a phenomenon by which people develop a preference for things solely because they are familiar with them. An increased exposure increases perpetual fluency, which is the ease of processing a stimulus. Perpetual fluency is effectively positive. And from the biological side of this, the other thing that they've discovered is that it's the different sides of our brain. The amygdala processes unknown information, which is also where we process danger. And the, the parental and occipital part of our brain is where we process familiar stimuli. So we've kind of gotten two like philosophical anchors. And so if we're going to accept the idea that being exposed to someone will make you more apt to have a positive effect from them, how often do you see someone? And I chose the multifamily model, and this is specifically the Texas donut, which is a more common uh, model in the states where everybody drives cars. And basically, they, they wrap residential around a parking lot. And so I took this idea, and I said, well, if I'm going to establish a gym, a restaurant, and say people are going to go to work once a day, and say people are going to leave the building once a day, how often do people see each other? So what happens is in this model, let me see. Actually, I do have a mouse, and it shows up good. Where you see if you can get someone in a room 30 minutes a day within a four hour period, three times a week randomly. The way I calculated this is I said, if there are two people in a room, then I counted one points of exposure time. If there are three people in a room, I counted two points of exposure time because they're, they're being exposed to two different people. So in the given amount of time with someone participating in this activity, which was, if you see in the green section, it's 30 minutes a day, uh, three to five times a week, uh, between the times of 4 and 7 p.m. and within a particular location, you see 980 minutes a week being aggregated. But then if you count the time it takes to go to the space, so let's say the same, we're going to say calculate distance, I'm walking to my space, what are the chances of seeing someone? Well, it was 1.6 minutes a week, nominal, almost nothing. So what I kind of came up, the conclusions I came from this multifamily housing exposure model is that basically all the destinations combined create a total amount of exposure of less than 10 minutes between all residents. And ultimately, if you're talking about circulation, you're not talking about community building. And that was something that I kind of was like, whoa. And then participating for 30 minutes four times a week between 4 and 7 p.m. will result in an average of 980 minutes. And then if in a restaurant you spend 60 minutes three times a week, between 5 and 9 p.m., you get a total aggregated accumulation of 1,080 minutes. It's an average increase of 10,000%. So what does that mean? So circulation has little impact on exposure to other residents. However, this is important. Circulation has more impact on exposure to activities. So community members accumulate significantly higher exposure times to each other when they participate in local activities. So the role of the architect is not necessarily in, in directly related to building community, but it's directly related in building interest in public space because at getting people into public space is what creates community. 
So the takeaway of kind of like the cornerstones I'm building my idea on is accept that preference influences how communities are formed. Realize that preferences are influenced by exposure and continually evolve. And then create circulation patterns that encourage the observation and occupation of public space. Utilizing diverse types of public amenities while increasing exposure to them through circulation design can increase preference for public space, which increases exposure between community members, encouraging communication towards a better sense of community. I decided to test my theory on the, multi, on the multifamily model residential as opposed to an urban design. I chose the Texas Donut, and if you're unfamiliar with the Texas Donut, it's basically America, we drive a lot more cars. Everybody has a car. Some people have two. Um, so basically, how do you hide the parking decks which are innately ugly? So basically, you separate them, you surround the residential around the parking deck, and you get the Texas Donut. So the, the mere exposure circulation analyzer, I made some assumptions. And ultimately, I'm creating a model to test things because there's been very little data to truly analyze in order to create what are the conditions that create the community that we desire. And so in my model, I assume that you're going to leave your building twice a day on foot to go walk to a nearby restaurant, to go to a library, to visit friends. Um, you will have 1.5 trips a day to and from work, and then the 0.5 would be to go to the grocery store or something that walking would be a little bit more difficult to do. Um, we have less small grocery stores in the States, a lot bigger ones that you have to drive to. And then utilities, um, half a trip a day going to the post office or the laundromat within your, within your unit. And then amenities, which would be the gym um, or whatever the other amenities in your building are. A half a trip a day, you're going every other day. And then the main entrance every other day to receive friends or maybe food that's being delivered or such. So I took a typical layout. And Texas Donuts, as you know, and most development communities are stock. Once they develop one, they all kind of look the same. Um, and I did a front-loaded condition where you can see, let me see if I can move this around, there we go, where you kind of see the front door, the utilities, and then the parking all within the same area. We have a gym kind of in the middle. I went to, uh, The gym within the middle. So everybody's basically going towards the front door which is great, you get a lot of exposure because everybody's going towards the front so they're more likely to see each other. It's not so great if you're considering some people don't want to meet other people. And if you're just trying to create the already social people, they're already going to be social and honestly, no matter what you do to thwart or help their situation, they're going to do it. And the people that are antisocial are more likely to find the back doors to leave the, most, the less desirable ways. So this creates a very condition you, you immediately segregate everybody in the community with the social people going out the front and the antisocial people going out the back. So I started playing with rearranging. I guess I should talk about the model. The program of this model, essentially, I took the space, I established all the doorways as, as basically destinations. So every doorway within the model is a destination, and I took the public space, um, and I divided it into grids, and then found the shortest path, assuming the shortest path was the way they were most likely to go. You can weight this by adding all the secondary paths and give them a second, a second level of, of weight, which could also modify the, uh, the model to some extent, and that's where actually taking the model and applying it, making assumptions and watching how it performs, which require more time, would help us decide what are those things that make more productive spaces. But in this one, I immediately moved the utility to the right-hand side, the right-hand side of, of, the, of the family unit, and you can immediately see how the red space pr previously, where you have basically red spaces, which are all spaces of isolation, and the blue spaces, which are heavy use, and the green spaces, which are moderate use, you kind of see immediately balancing of, of the uh, layout. With this one, I move the, the gym over out from the middle, moved it to the side, and you even get more, you even get less spaces of isolation now in the middle, and you start to see the blue space kind of pervade on the perimeters as well as in the front. I got a little bit more dramatic to see what I could do to create the most even space, the most active space within my unit. And I moved a lot of things around. I moved the utilities over, I moved things towards the corner, I changed my parking entrances. And with this condition was actually, once again, I'm making the assumption that I want everybody to move the space equally. 
Um, you see the blue space is showing up on almost every corner of every intersection in green space throughout with a minimal amount of red. This last one is a little unrealistic because with this one you're putting all the parking entrances and if you see these right here, the parking entrances are on the far, the far left hand side which are now you're making people walk unnecessarily which could create a point of tension within the space and now you're creating a condition where real estate becomes more valuable simply because of location and not to the parking as opposed to an equal, an equal value throughout the space. I took, this, I took this and applied it to other people's style of modeling because if you're in Revit or another program, you want to make sure that your program is adaptable to different people's styles and able to analyze it accordingly. And um, future improvements for my program, and ultimately I didn't really have any shoulders to stand on, was the ability to establish public space, establish destinations without the use of doors within the Revit model, and create more factors. The way, I, the way I did this one is you have a slider. So if you disagree with mine, you say, well, in my, in my community, we're primarily a pedestrian community. We're leaving out through these exits. We're more likely the grocery stores to be located here. You would essentially establish doors within your model, and you could change your sliders to how many trips you imagine a day it would be so you could see how many times people are passing by particular spaces. So the input was the Revit floor plan for a multifamily apartment, though you have to establish a shared parameter called circulation, and a shared parameter for the doors um, to establish your um, space for circulation and your destinations, and the frequency of use for each type of path. The output is a heat map of high traffic and low traffic areas, and all circulation from apartments to each specific destination. Um, I would like to conclude to say that architecture as a whole, I think, has not necessarily tackle the social issue. I have, since I started this, I've had a lot of criticism when architects should not be social engineers and should not get into the social conversation. With 50 years of mere exposure effect and its established criteria within the marketing community, literally they decide when you should play your commercial, what billboards you should be on, how far they should be spaced apart, what neighborhoods you should be in, Coca-Cola, all these big companies spend millions of dollars, billions of dollars, establishing this marking criteria. I believe that architecture should establish the same. The way we're going to establish is to start to make assumptions and to be willingly wrong, frequently, and make these decisions in order to find what arrangements, what solutions, what programs create the, the highest level of social impact. Because ultimately, it's, it's, the minor, it's the minor likes, it's the minor dislikes that connect us together. When we, can, when we can start tackling you know, bigger issues, when we can start having common conversation. Thank you.